Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm joined by three lecturers from our Carmarthen campus who are going to answer some questions for us on tips and tricks for getting through everything from assessments to different levels of study. And um, yeah, I'm going to hand it over to them to introduce themselves. Ken, do you want to go first? Okay, thanks. Thanks, Tommy. <laughs> so um, my, my name's uh, Ken Dix and I'm the newest member of the team that's, that's on screen at the moment. I teach on the social studies, sociology and adv advocacy degrees. And I'm also a student studying towards my master's in equity and diversity in society. Good morning. My name is Philip Morgan and uh, I'm the program manager for the BA Advocacy and BA Sociology, um, Cert so HE Social Studies. Also have the privilege of lecturing on the MA Equity and Diversity in Society. I'm also a student at the moment, currently engaged in my PhD studies, so fully understand uh, the stresses and tensions that that brings to uh, what for many people is a very, very full, full life. So quite understand. Yeah. And I'm Dr. Caroline Norman Hancock. I've been around the block for over 20 years with the University of Welster in St. David. Um, so I work with these two people, which is fabulous. Um, and I also am the programme director on the MA Equity and Diversity in Society, which Ken's on. I also run the PhD Social Justice, which Phil's on. I'm a supervisor. Hey, hey, I'm both your supervisors. Um, mm -hmm. I also deli de uh, deliver on the undergraduate degrees, advocacy, sociology, social studies, and I work with these guys. So it's a fab thing to do. Absolutely shattered. I don't know about you guys, but being online all the time is a little wearing. So for you guys as students, yeah, we're feeling the pain, guys. Yeah, shared pain. We're getting, Absolutely. We're getting Heart goes out. Awesome. <laughs> Um, for those of you that haven't met me yet, my name is Tammy Bowie and I'm your Lancer Campus Student President. I'm going to be asking the questions today. So <clears throat> let's get started then. The theme for these kind of interview questions are kind of around managing your time. So I'm going to be posing some questions to these lecturers and they're going to give us their uh, kind of thoughts on how to manage your time with these things. So first thing up, um, we're going to look at like databases and how to kind of like use them effectively so do any of you have any experience with databases or like how to go about using them yeah we we use them a lot and i think it's one of the key things for research um if you just read the odd uh online lecture you aren't going to get your marks guys what you need to do is in-depth reading and work things through so there's a lot of databases out there and one of the things i would say is go speak to the library staff they're amazing give them an email sure. ask them for a tutorial they will give you a tutorial and if there's a few of you go online have a team's tutorial um, the databases that are out there um, are very very useful for us because we are practice based so we do social policy so there is a debate about database of periodicals, newspapers, which you could go back over years and see how politics have changed, social policy has changed, social attitudes have changed. So they're fab. Also, we've got some fabulous databases, um, which are longitudinal studies, which are external to the university. Um, so cohort studies. Um, so those are also fabulous and really worthwhile looking at if you're involved with um, social policy or practice or sociology. And, and I was just thinking, funny enough, it came up in one of my lectures yesterday. One of the online databases that is really important when we're looking at deprivation in Wales mm. is the Wales Index of Multiple Deprivation, Absolutely. which is a fantastic database set up by the Welsh Government where you can drill down to individual small areas in a community and find out what levels of deprivation yeah. uh, apply there. So, yeah, that's a good one for us. Yeah. You, 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 um, the United Nations databases are also good. Um, they're fabulous. And UNESCO, et cetera, the, the uh, United Nations Education Science, et cetera. They are fabulous. What they've got is just free. Why invent the wheel? So, but again, remember, reference them correctly. Make sure you know your referencing style. What, one thing to add to that, guys, and very often often overlooked, depending on your area of study, um, the Houses of Parliament website Ooh, good point. is an good absolute goldmine for information. Mm. It shows how uh, policies have arrived on our doorstep, how that process works, gives a massive insight into currently what's available. So sometimes thinking beyond the uh, the periodicals and, and drilling down into what our statutory organisation databases can provide a massive uh, resource as you know, with, with many programmes, there's a, there's, a, there's a mix of uh, theory, policy, and with us, definitely practice. So in that golden triangle, uh, it's really important to to piece things together and to look at different databases on each corner of that triangle. So oh. theory, policy, practice, Caroline, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I was going to say, the other one that goes with that is Ipsumori. 
Ibsen Mori is amazing, absolutely fab. So Ibsen Mori is really worth. You can go in, you can run Excel sheets, you can take the data out, you can produce graphs. Absolutely amazing. And I was going to say something very Miranda then, but I can't say amaze and the next word. So no. <laughs> and, and also from that, you may gather that our, our real data junkie is Caroline. <laughs> Absolutely. It's fabulous. Numbers are our friends. Well, clearly our team have a lot of experience with databases and stuff. So if any of these sound great and you want more information, I'm sure they'd be more than happy for you guys to get in contact with them. So please feel free to do that. Uh, we're going to move on so we don't turn this into a four hour video. <laughs> uh, <laughs> We're going to take a little look at assessment types. So um, what I'll do is I'll bring up a kind of assessment. Um, if you have kind of like a golden rule or a bit of advice that you'd like to give, then please feel free to chime in. So the first one that we've got on our list is essays, which is the standard like bear of every single student who has to write an essay. Uh, do different length essays have different expectations? How does it kind of work? Mm -hmm. I, do you mind because again this came up with yeah, students yesterday I think the important thing with an essay is the first thing you need to think about is the word count if, if it's a shorter word count don't try and fit everything you know about the subject in because mm -hmm. you, you'll run out of space focus on the question look at the word count and think what are they looking for in the space they've given me look for key words yes. in the question so look at what is the focus what is the subject and then what is it they want to do with the subject so if the subject is, um, I don't know, classical mythology, do they want you to compare it with a range of perhaps European versus um, uh, Maori mythology? Or do they want you to evaluate it? Do they want you to critique it? What is it they want you to do? So what is the subject and what is it they want to do with you? If you can get those two parts of your question, you're more likely to hit the, hit the button. Can I, I'm going to add something there, guys. And, and um... One of the key things is getting started, and sometimes we often sit and we look at a blank screen and we think, oh, what's next? So let me give you a little bit of a tip here, guys. Um, when you receive your assessment question, what you'll find is that that's actually your introduction. So when the, the assessment criteria says critically evaluate or discuss and describe, and then it sets out the question, in a sense, that's your introduction this essay will, this submission will, and then you're, you're almost restating the question. If you then sprinkle into then that uh, introduction, the learning outcome that's required from within the assessment, then that's your, that's your introduction done. So we've written it for you in a sense. I know, aren't we good? That's but, amazing. <laughs> yeah, so the question and the learning outcomes are your introduction. It is also your roadmap through the essay. So if you keep referring back to your essay, then uh, to your essay introduction, now then key things happen here, guys, is that throughout your essay, you will build from the introduction. You will have key points in your essay, group those together, bring them to a conclusion as opposed to a summary, which there's a separate difference there. And then that's the point of your spear. So if you think about it, You've got the weight of your argument, and then the point is where you get to. Caroline, come on, you, 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 yeah, you talk I, to this, Caroline. Come on. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, it's, it's, I get excited about this because when you tell students, they go, oh, is that what it is then? Oh, it's really easy. Yeah. Conclusions are technically, or usually, the worst bit of a, 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 a student's assignment. Um, I've got a, a sort of a bit of a rule I, I tell students. Mm -hmm. A conclusion is, a so what? Who cares? What next? And what that means is the so what is brief resume of what you found out. Mm -hmm. Who cares? Who does it implicate? What does it implicate? What does it mean? What next? What's got to change? Because we're social policy and social so society mm -hmm. and community. So the who, what, so what, um, who, what, who cares, what next is really useful. Three things. Just make sure you put it in your conclusion. So just to finish up on that thing, guys, if you're writing about something that you don't believe in, it's going to be tough. So what we as lecturers try and do is to stand on your academic foot so you're annoyed and then you can get go ahead and write with passion and focus because you're writing to build to a point at the point of your argument. So for me, guys, um, that my job is to stand on your academic foot and in that annoyance that that is, then you say, can I have an extra 10,000 words on this point because no. I'm really passionate about it and we have to say, sorry, no, but it's that level of excitement about your work 
uh, and and hopefully you you'll find some of the insights today helpful to to generate that yeah that was brilliant thank you so much it's the students who are preparing for presentations okay yeah th this is a really interesting one because it's it's part of the employability theme that runs through our uh, our whole course um most people don't like giving presentations certainly when they're first asked and we first tell them this is what we want you to do i think the, the key thing is even if you don't like it you will be asked to do it in the future as a job interview or even as an academic when you have to give a presentation at conference so get used to it yeah you and we're supportive your fellow students are supportive as well take the opportunity to practice take the feedback look at the feedback and by year three you'll be thinking do you know what they're not giving me enough time to talk so That's what's, really, what's really interesting at the moment is is that our students have gotten used to delivering face to face beyond that they've recorded videos and submitted those and then we're now moving forward to live streaming seminars so these skill sets are extremely important in the workplace the people that we meet in practice as practitioners, they say, wow, this is amazing. This is what we need for our client bases. So um, my tip here would be, guys, when you come to present, breathe both in and out. <laughs> if, if you just think, plan and prepare, rehearse, you'll, you'll be fine. Trust yourself and we will support you to get to get better. I'll, um, add a couple, I'll add a couple of things about that as well is think about all those people that bored you silly when they spoke some that spoke really really fast and they didn't know you were there and they just went on others who just droned when they talked to you about their lectures try and not be them you know show your enthusiasm also keep your head up and look at the audience if you're sat behind a piece of paper believe me eye contact's gone um and actually just think these are people they're not divine. They are mortal in front of you. They are human beings. Do you know what? Chill. Um, and enjoy it. Have a blast. Amazing. I think that summarised presentations really, really well. Thank you all for that. Um, kind of just want to move on to the dreaded dissertation. So do you have not any advice? Not dreaded, it's fab. No. Oh, I've written one it. recently. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, let, let's get a grip of dissertations now. Look, you have tr trust yourself, OK? Um, there's a long story in there, and the punchline is relax and fly the plane. And, and I won't bore you with a big story, but basically someone's in the cockpit of a plane. They've had a few flying lessons, and it's OK. Little post-it note here to say, put the flaps, and to make sure I got the speed and, and the elevation of the plane right. And there's one more post-it note that this guy remembers from his five flying lessons. And what is it? relax and fly the plane guys we trust you you've had all of this time and feedback trust yourself so in terms of your dissertation it is the flagship document that you can take forward into your employability to support so again i'll come back to what i said earlier on pick a subject pick a question obviously in conjunction with your supervisor that motivates you to write if you pick something that you were thinking oh this is boring it's going to be tough Pick something that switches you on, lights you up, and that you're passionate about. By the third year, you will know what that is instinctively. It's our job to support you with that, and we look forward to doing that uh, at both the lectures and the supervisions. Caroline, I know you're going to add to yeah, this. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> um, I supervise undergraduate, which is usually about 10,000 words. I supervise masters, which used to be 25,000. Then it came to 20, and it's now only 15,000 words. But I also supervise PhD students at 100,000 words. One of the Gosh. big things, yeah, Phil, you're there and you're, you're you know, both of these guys are on the, 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 the 15 and the 100,000s. Um, what my experience is it with? When you look at a dissertation, everybody goes, Gosh, the words count's huge. Stop. What you are doing is writing lots of little essays which you are joining together creating signposts between sections you tell the reader why this bit is going to move into the next bit Absolutely. and i love winnie the pooh winnie the pooh says when you've got a long journey i think it's probably confucius and winnie the pooh's probably nicked it so no, sorry but, you know, winnie but, he's doing a bit of plagiarism <laughs> winnie the pooh but winnie Correct the pooh says, I, yes but i love <laughs> winnie the pooh you know winnie the pooh as cited you know cited by anyway winnie the pooh says start at the beginning and keep going till you get to the end. And what is that is one step 
at a time. So it was actually Confucius. So I do apologize. I love Winnie the Pooh and the, you know, Winnie the Pooh, the philosophy of Pooh I've got in my, my, my bookcase. So, but actually, that's what it is. If you look at it in its whole big bit, you just go, I cannot do this. If you go, can I write 500 words? Well, most of us go, yeah, well, not brilliant, but I'll give it a whirl. I'll, and then you're going to put them together. So yep. that's the first thing I say. The second thing is you never write from the first word to the end. So word one to word 100,000 or word one to 15,000 or word one to 10,000. You write out of order. If you've got a bit that's easy to write, start off with the easy bit first. Get your confidence and then go to the, uh, the bit, which is maybe before, maybe after. So that's my advice. But remember Winnie the Pooh. I love Winnie the Pooh. Undervalued as a bear. Oh, I'm with you. So, guys, basically what Caroline's hinted at there is very often you can start in the middle, start with your literature review and exploration. And then by the time you reach the end, you go back and write the introduction. So there are ways of writing that seem illogical, but they're very sensible. And of course, during the um, the preparation lessons and lectures for um, for for your dissertation class, we're going to be talking through this. We're going to be talking through everything from your proposal through to the ethical approval that's needed right the way through to uh, managing your progress throughout your dissertation. So we have the privilege and, and trust me, it absolutely is. Uh, I understand this more as a lecturer. Uh, Caroline was my supervisor at undergrad level. I now understand the privilege that we have, <laughs> the privilege of position to be your critical friend along your journey and, and guys trust me we we absolutely love doing that we can't wait to support you on your journey i'll give you one more bit of evidence really really important there's been a whole load of research about those who finish and do well in their dissertation whether it's undergraduate masters or phd the research is clear if you attend your supervisions and follow the advice from your supervisor you are more likely to pass and do well. Those students who do not attend their supervision or see it as an irritant are more likely to have a lower mark or not complete. So mm. that's the research evidence that's out there. Oh, wow. That's that's amazing, isn't it? That, that is absolutely... Clear correlation if yeah. you want the numeric term. Yeah. Yeah. Moral of the story, ladies and gents, and non-binary pals, do not hide from your supervisors. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it may be scary, <laughs> but remember, they all sleep in their PJs. Well, they might not have PJs, but you know the feeling. <laughs> there we go. Do you have any um, tips or tricks for students when it comes to referencing? So whether that, regardless of their referencing style, whether they use bibliographies, footnotes, all that kind of stuff. Okay. That's probably um, the sort of referencing plagiarism queen um, or king or person. Gender non specific <laughs> expert. John, yes, um, uh, Monic. Um, yeah, one of the interesting things. First thing is keep a record of everything. Organised records make your life easier. So if you read it, there is a theory you should only read it once. If you are going to read it and there's got something good in there, Note down what's good, even a page number, and write it as if you were referencing it in your bibliography. So you've got the full information verbatim. Now, some of us use um, uh, online resources to do this. You've got RefWorks, so if you want RefWorks, that can do some of it for you. But I quite like the good old fashioned get your own referencing system or your organization system. If you save it, save it with a sensible big thing. When you save an online resource or a PDF, Give it a name that makes sense. And I would suggest you do author, year and title, but your title to give it a shorten. So why you've actually saved it? Because if you've got the author in year, you can tell yourself, oh, that's an old source. That's a good source. And if the title's right, when you go back to it, you'll go, it's not just X, P, Y, Z, hyphen number 33, which is what a lot of the strings when you save a PDF are. So that's useful. Um, alphabetize size it. In other words, put it from A to Z, A to Z. If you do that, there is a, um, a little lovely widget on Word that will sort out your A to Z without you having to move them around. So lots of shortcuts. So some of those things I'm going to try and get together. I'm going to give to Tammy, who's interviewing us now. And maybe that's a resource that you might want to throw out later on. Awesome. I need to start doing that. The amount of documents I've got that are saved VFTSJ is ridiculous. First thing I do with all my supervisory students. What's your filing system like? Let me look at it. This is what you're going to do. 
Can I just I'll add in there, right? As as someone who's been trained by Caroline, uh, student and, and lecturer, I'll say that that system is robust. It works, and you don't lose your documents. Mostly, obviously, you need to remember <laughs> to follow the rules. Not following the rules has obviously consequences. But once you commit to it, it works. Trust the system, guys. It's brilliant. Awesome. Do you have any um, English? <laughs> no, <laughs> like, come of English, not that good. I have to be honest, Tammy, I'm working on my English. <laughs> Do you have any tips and tricks for students who are writing reflections or reflective pieces? Yeah, I think um, probably as, as that's something that falls into a couple of the modules that I teach at the moment, I'll take that for the team. Um, I think the important thing is in most lots of professions ask their uh, their professionals to reflect. And I think the important thing is it's often given the phrase reflective practice and it is something you need to practice to get right. Reflection in, in all of the, the walks of life that I've seen it professionally isn't just about thinking about what's just happened. It's about thinking about what's happened in a professional way applying knowledge, understanding and research to help you understand it more and then coming up with something positive that you can do based on that research. Mm -hmm. I think particularly undergraduates, one of the things they fall down on is they think I'm just asking them to tell me about their day. Mm -hmm. I am not. I'm asking them to reflect professionally on an experience, bring knowledge and understanding to that so that next time they will do it even better. Mm -hmm. Amazing. You could ask ref reflexivity to that, which is that internal conversation about how you emotionally um, engage with the process. Um, I always say to my students that when I lecture, um, I've got to put all my angst at the door. So, you know, God forbid that I run over the dog. I haven't got a dog, but if I had one, if I ran it over, I would still have to come to work and lecture. But my internal reflections on that about how I handled it is important. If something goes wrong, it's not just it went wrong, I put it right, but it's also about thinking, what is it emotionally that I invested in that? Why did I respond shortly with people? Why was I perhaps really nice to this person and not to another? Why did I procrastinate? That's so that reflexivity is also really important, which goes with reflection. And I know Ken does all of this. He's fab. He is the, the man. On can, our I, can I add, add to that? I'll second that with Ken. I've sat in on some of the sessions, guys. This is where you need to go if you want to think about reflective practice. What I would add, just a cautionary note, when I first engaged with reflective practice, I don't know when exactly that was, but when I started to think about my actions and experiences in the day, what I found was I could really easily spiral downwards in a negative, oh, seeing all the yeah. poor very things very done good. and whatever. Mm. You, That would be natural, except that as being part of learning how, Ken said, to practice the process of being reflective. When you realise that, hang on a minute now, you've done other things really well, and these are just things that you need to work on, improve, and we're on a, on a learning journey, use the things and the models that Ken will, uh, will, will deliver in his lectures, the different models of reflection, use them to build forward. So we very often said, oh, you give students feedback about their work. No, we give students feed forward. And that's a whole new concept in terms of not spiral down, but build forward. So again, having sat in the sessions, we can, mm. guys, there's your reflect, reflective practice. Caroline, the reflexivity is brilliant, and that's where I'm at at the moment. So guys, this is where we reflect and, and, and reflex in our work, yeah? So hope that's helpful. And that is really important for mental health and health and well-being. Oh. And what you were saying is really important as well. There's no point just beating ourselves up about what we haven't done well. We need to understand and, and unpack that went well. Let's do it again. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm glad yeah, you yeah. said that. It's really important. It's really important. That was a really good, really good summary on that. Thank you for that. Um, the next bit that we're going to ask about is databases. So yes. <laughs> we've got that might be people. Caroline, I think. <laughs> okay, databases. Yeah, we, I mean, we mentioned Gist Store, and one of the things I think the the library web resources are totally underused by staff and students. Sometimes I have to say, yes. I I possibly go to <coughs> Google Scholar perhaps when I should go to the library. So I'm trying to rectify that in my own um, reflective and reflexive practice approach to my own writing. 
So if you go onto the library website, at the top, you've got the top left hand corner, what you've got is a little icon of the university logo. And in the middle, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six different little white um, squares with black words, which are easily missed because everything else is colour. And they say new search. Fine, we know how to use search. Browse e-journals, extremely useful because they're recent relevant and they're within the last 18 months to two years of data collection. A book will take seven to eight years to publish, maybe five if you're lucky. I haven't been involved with those things myself. In the middle, it says database search. These are databases which are linked to the university. Now, on once you've clicked that, on the left-hand side, you will find the Institute of Education and Humanities. You will then find underneath that, Institute of Management and Health, and also the Institute of Art and um, Science and Art. Each of those have a drop down list. Each of those have a set of subjects, or, um, I say subject specific, subject frames within which there's a whole set of databases. Mm -hmm. And you can click into those and those databases that will enter up. So there's got one, if I go to conflict and war, not that I want to talk about war today, but heck it just was in front of me. So in that you've got three different set databases. And if you go into that and do an online search, you have some really fabulous, very specific stuff that will res respond to what your question is on your work. Remember, and we can say this together, boys, we are reading for a degree. That's what we're <laughs> doing. That requires us to look at books and journals. Let's say it again. What are we doing? Reading for a degree. So sometimes what we think we're doing is searching the internet. We're not, we're reading for the degree. So that is fabulous. One more, which is fabulous for anybody who's interested in um, the social and the community world. And that might be any of you guys. I have, you, you, you might think of classics as just being classics. Classics relates to the world. And from that classical world, you may want to compare it to the modern world. Well, here's a grand, grand place, fab place to go. And that's the, um, uh, University College London, if you go to their website and you put in cohort studies, it'll give you all the cohort studies that have been done over the last oh, 25, 30, 40 years. So those longitudinal studies um, could be obesity studies. It could be studies about poverty. It could be studies about but what they do is track an individual set of people over decades. Some of these are 50 years old. Fabulous database. Worth doing. Does that help? Awesome. Thank you. So, the next thing that we're going to talk about, and we're going to see those, um, common modules. So, obviously, common modules are a relatively new introduction mm -hmm. for multiple multiple students in EWTSD. Have you got any um, kind of like suggestions on how to adapt to a new module style? First of all, don't panic. Breathe. Yeah. Think about the rabbit in the headlights. The car comes along, the rabbit sees the lights and stands still. What happens to the rabbit? It has an early demise. It dies. So what we want you to do is not do that. Obviously, you're not rabbits and nor are we rabbits. Um, but certainly when you see something that is quantifiably different, your first response is flight or fight. And in academia, it's frequently flight. So what are we going to do? Breathe and trust your tutor. Big one, trust your lecturer to talk you through. When they say, don't worry about this now, we'll do it next week, trust them and focus on what they have asked you to do. Um, one of the big things about all the modules um, is they have a set of tasks one needs to complete. These tasks need to have been indicated that they have been completed. Some of them will automatically give you a tick. Others you have to manually tick. So that's the first thing. Check all the boxes are ticked because they will give you some marks towards your overall mark for that module. Work through systematically. And if you don't understand something, ask your lecturer because they'll explain it mm -hmm. and they will they will support you through. Um, the last thing, the whole point of them, there is the long online sort of um, uh, uh, information literacy, which is the updated version of computer literacy and knowledge literacy. That is really important. But the other thing is to link it to your subject area. Mm. Um, that's also something that your lecturer will do. So they would be my most up to date comments, having just started teaching the level fours the first years on the new module. And I think I'll chip in because the way we've distributed the common modules amongst the team is I've got the first level five module. Um, and obviously level five students 
who are used for a year to, to have delivery in a certain style um, have perhaps expressed some, some concerns about it. But once they get to grips with it, what they realise is if they trust the tutor and the tutorial time is there for them to ask questions, for us to contextualise it, the online activities give them even more freedom than they had before to learn at a pace, at a time, in a place that is suitable for them. So again, if, if you're a student who has caring duties, work alongside your studies, um, the, the common modules give you that freedom to look at the materials at a, in a time, at a pace, in a place that suits you, and then your tutor can help you with questions and to contextualize it. So take advantage of the freedom that it gives you. That would be my advice. And I think what goes with that is the phrase bite-sized. There's lots of bite-sized activity. Don't aim to do the whole unit, do a bit. And also there's got some fun stuff. Um, the little questionnaires and survey things are really good. And it makes you go, oh, I can click a box. Hey, I can do this. Um, so treat it as fun size. I think Ken's comments are really brilliant. And can I just say, I'm, I'm, I think the time, the pace, the place probably comes from a martini advert from the 1970s. <laughs> Yes, I'm referencing Winnie the Pooh, but goodness sake. So, so guys, in terms of the, the, the I, I got the, I've got the pleasure of dealing with the, um, and delivering the level six common module. And uh, people who were thinking, oh, I'm going to do a, a dissertation uh, and oh, I've got a, an independent project to do. Well, all it is, is, is the common module holds a variety of options. I think there's three different types of options from portfolio to dissertation uh, in different uh, respects your lecturer will translate that into the actions that you need to do. So again, following on from what Caroline said, from what Ken said, uh, trust the lecturer to guide you through what you need to do to achieve success in that module. What's brilliant this year is, is that we have teaching time, we have tutorial time, we have a number of tasks that build towards the, the completion. Lecturers have some flexibility in which comes first, for example, a presentation at the beginning or a presentation at the end. And there are benefits in different um, disciplines to doing that at different stages. So when you look at the common module, it is exactly what it is. It's sort of common things that fit in most uh, dissertation type portfolio evidence based flagship um, production or, or, or output as it's called. So there's new terminology in there like uh, output tutor, uh, coordinating tutor. It's all new words for the same thing. Someone delivers the lecture, someone supports you with your dissertation right the way through to successful completion. I've got to say, um, really, really positively looking forward to this year's level six um, common module. There's things in there we can take and build on, enhance that with the things we're doing already. And I'm really optimistic about what it holds uh, in store to support the students through to when they float across the stage in their black cape and, and the flat hat. and and. And hopefully we'll get back to that point sometime really soon. So guys, trust us, we're going to look after you. Awesome, that's a really nice way to end that. Thank you. OK, so the next couple of questions I've got for you are around specific kind of levels of study as opposed to assessment types and things like that. So we have our level threes who, correct me if I'm wrong, are our foundation students. Do you have any kind of golden like tips for our foundation students on coming to university? Okay, okay well, I'll jump in there. I was going to say, I think Ken actually would be quite useful for that. But Phil first. That yeah. bridge. What I was going to say was, it, it, I was going to jump in there really quickly and say, Ken does an awful lot with our um, outreach work with schools. I tend to do that with colleges and the work overlaps. But I think in terms of tips and, and hints and, and guides, it's again, trust your lecturer, jump in, have a go. And we need to get over this fear of being wrong. Uh, and the, the fact that if we out of 100 percent, we get 41 percent right. So that's good. We will hold that. And then moving forward, then we'll say, right, what do I need to work on? And that's the feed forward. So Ken does some very specific things with uh, that area. Uh, and Ken, I just wanted to just say, lead it in for you there and say, we know as a team, <laughs> we know as a team how beneficial that is in generating uh, okay. in increased student numbers and uh, participation in the programme. So over to you. Yeah, so I mean, what I was going to say was actually because again, um, our programmes are new to the humanities group, and I'm not even sure whether it's just humanities that this is aimed at. 
um, on, but I, I think we don't currently do foundation. What we tend to do is have strong links that Phil's created with further education colleges who run uh, social studies, advocacy and related courses. Um, but I think if you are coming onto a foundation, onto a level three um, level course at university, the, the key thing is what you're doing there is you're starting a journey. You might decide at the end of level three, that's enough for you and you want to go down a different route. I think particularly with a foundation course, it, it, it does exactly what it says. It's to set a foundation on that foundation. You may need to want to build off in a different direction. Academia beyond level three is not necessarily for everyone, but see it as the start of a journey. And over that year, if it's a year course, um, you find out what where you want to go next. And it may not be to continue to level four, um, but that's why it's a foundation. It's something to build on. I think having worked with some of the level three courses over the years, because we've had them for a number of years, um, my comment is bring your experience with you. Oh. Often people who take level three um, they are not always straight from school. They they sometimes are mature students. I mean, one of the oldest students that walked the boards and graduated with our, um, a degree that one of the degrees I ran years ago was 89, wow. 89 young. And he started on a foundation. He came out from the mines at 13 um, or came into the mines at 13 and started going down the mines and doing some of the, the, the top work rather than in the mine and then graduated to becoming a miner. He had very little schooling a wealth of experience and that experience was valued by the young students on the course and so mm -hmm. it was incredible how he mixed and they mixed with him as if it was seamless yeah. and the respect that was in the class was important so I think sometimes um, a lot of the foundation courses are for what we call non-traditional mature students or widening access what it means is people who've lived a bit and living a bit matters and I tell you what, when I'm facing a class of, um, I don't know, 30 students, the average age for them, the mean age is something like 30. Well, 30 times 30 is a heck of a lot of years. I can't match that with my experience. I can match it with academia, but that experience, I can't live it. What we find is that experience actually is transferable to HE if that is your, your line. And as Ken says, I think he's right. HE isn't the, the, the be all and end all. For some people, HE is not it, and that is not a failure. That is, you've done something you wanted to do and you've followed your journey. What a fabulous thing to have done. You've made your life your own. Can I just jump in there a minute now and just add something there? We explore links with uh, our partner organisations, many of whom run vocational courses. And there's a realisation at the moment in, in many of the um, disciplines and in many of the practices is that you might need both. So, for example, we produce a BA degree in advocacy. When the students go into practice, they need an NVQ as a ticket to practice. So what's happening at the moment is our students will perhaps do, um, on their study for their BA degree, they'll be studying for their uh, vocational level three course alongside that. So we have a transfer from vocational to higher education, which is now, uh, I wouldn't say seamless, but it's commonplace. And we're working on the moment on partnership agreements so that there's that interface between the two in recognising that having the academic qualifications may not support practice only and practice only won't get you the manager's job or may not or may. So there's this appreciation for what practice needs for you to have a ticket to practice, but then the benefits of enhanced performance from the higher education. And, and like the guys say, this journey through education is different for all of us and we find where we're happy for the now and maybe come back and visit later so any level three uh sort of whether it's vocational or education based is valuable build that with experience do a bit more and everybody's journey flows at a different rate so um as someone who joined higher education at 50 years of age i'm going to say then the sky's the limit. You go where you want to go. Yeah, absolutely. So embrace it, guys. Amazing. We're going to jump to the other end of the spectrum a little bit now. Have you got any advice for students who are potentially moving from undergraduate to postgraduate study on adjusting to the jump, anything like that? OK, first of all, the undergraduate is a little bit more, as I say, I've run masters, I've run master programmes for 
I don't know, 18 years. Um, and I also am responsible for the PhD for social justice, so um, that postgraduate um, research level as well. We've had students that have come in from undergraduate who go to want a master's. What are the requirements? We usually say a two one or above. Two twos are often considered a non-traditional, and particularly for our subject, we actually consider non-traditional. We'll ask you to do a task which is written, even if you haven't got a degree. It's we ha we have to put you through that to ensure that we are not sort of, um, putting you forward to fail. So what is requirements? Um, I think the difference between undergraduate and masters, you have the potential at masters to begin to create new meaning and new knowledge. In other words, you are starting to develop new knowledge for others to read and to consume. Um, does that mean that undergraduates don't do that? Some undergraduates will with their dissertation collect data. The masters or the MRes, which is another one, which is a masters in research, or the MPhil or the MSc, um, again, there's, there's the science side. What we want is somebody who's highly motivated, who can time manage. Now, one of the biggest um, things that impacts upon people not completing or not completing their degree well at master's level or um, a PhD is lack of time management and focus. You have to want this. And the phrase I would use is you need to be hungry. You need to go, you need to go I want this. And it may not be for a job. It may be for me, but a job may come out of it. Mm. So having that that absolute a little bit of OCD isn't a bad thing doesn't mean that people without that can't do it no of course you can what it means is you've got to want it and it's going to cost you time wise and it's going to cost you um, effort that you will have to do on your own there will be talk components but there will also be a lot of work that you do independently but I love it I've done a couple of the darn things at master's level because I quite like doing things like that um, the joy of seeing students progress from undergraduate to master's is fab and sometimes the not as strong academically do better at masters because they're determined and the really academically able don't want it enough. So it's not about just ability. It's about who you are and what you want out of life. Mm -hmm. Moving on to a PhD, we do take PhD students with a 2-1, but a master's is a little bit easier to get in. But we take in a number with a 2-1 degree. So that is usual. Will we take somebody without a degree? Occasionally we do. And particularly in classics, you may have a professional, not classic, sorry, humanities, you may have a professional qualification. Um, so we have theologians that perhaps are practic practicing in, in the um, um, their local church or in their um, diocesan or whatever, that may not have the formal traditional degree. So there are opportunities to move into this without. It is more difficult, mm -hmm. but certainly a first degree is ideal a master's may profess, prepare some because you're beginning to create new knowledge. Um, so determination, organisation, and you remember what I said earlier, if you listened to the previous one, those that work with their supervisor and attend and keep in regular contact and, and listen and um, transfer that to their work are more likely to succeed. That's what the research tells us. The data tells us that if you keep in touch and you do the work and keep on task, you will get there. It's a pleasure to supervise masters and PhDs. I always feel as if I'm actually being paid to do something I actually enjoy. Um, it is an honor to walk <laughs> side by side of people creating new knowledge. And I just go, what, what an honor to be able to be part of that. So as a supervisor and, and res manager of research degrees for the humanities, yeah, what a, what a fabulous job we have as lecturers. Absolutely, absolutely. Amazing. OK, so the next question I have for you is actually around study support and the kind of different types of support that's available for students. OK, um, if you don't mind, guys, I'll take this one. We, we I all say Ken might be good at this also because Ken works with some of those students that are struggling. I think I think okay. you've got some good uh, what we were talking about earlier on, Ken, do you remember? Yeah, so I think as as PD who set up the personal tutorials that we've just done. Phil first and then I'll jump okay, in. Okay, cool. Thank you, Ken. I, I wanted to jump in and say that this is really important because you can tell already that we're all really keen to tell you what we're doing. We're all excited. We all, we all participate in student support. We all participate in academic or personal tutorial support because we're human beings and, and we actually care. So as students, critical friend in an academic sense. We have academic tutorials and we support, we unpack questions, we have sessions where we do group work and work towards. We will review and we will have some email contact with students re with regards to their work. 
personal tutorials then are perhaps the opportunity for a student to say, help, I've got a bit of a problem, and the lecturer will signpost them towards the appropriate services. As a bit of a halfway house between the two, we've started this morning, as it turns out, uh, both Ken and myself have engaged today, Caroline later on, um, in a drop-in session. And uh, we've already learned an awful lot, uh, and that is the students appear to appreciate being acknowledged as human beings, as opposed to just a number on a screen and, and whatever. So the human interaction during tough times that we're going through at the moment is absolutely essential. So it's about a range of measures because no one size fits all. Some people can attend on a Wednesday, not on a Thursday, so we rotate the days. Some people prefer a bit of a group chat because they don't want to stand out in a crowd. Others are happy to speak regardless. So in trying to make sure nobody slips through the gaps, we've got uh, a range of drop-in sessions. The way we teach at the moment is face-to-face. -face. It is in the classroom or at home streamed online. We've been recording lectures for years, and I know Caroline pioneered this back many years ago. So this has been happening at master's level as, as a matter of standard procedure. So the students can sit through um, a whole lecture and then have the chance to play it on plus one again later on. So if they've missed something, so tips and tricks is, if you are watching a video of a lecture and you think, oh heck, there was something said about a certain subject, I need to find that. Well, when you're sitting through the lecture, why not make a note of the time so you can fast forward or rewind to that point and go straight to the bit you want? It's a bit like Caroline's tip earlier on about referencing and filing. Where, oh, where did I put that? So again, now, I know Ken and, and Caroline will cover different things with regards to support, but if we start from the point that no one size fits all, but we're trying to get to the mass of students, we want to make sure we pick the ones up on the edge and the periphery. And this is where things like student reps, where talking and making contact, different levels of tutorial and different types of tutorial, different routes to, to find that um, support are really, really important. And if you haven't gathered it by now, we're kind of passionate about being um, the critical friend that guides our students, but drives them and supports them towards successful completion of, the, of their degree. And, and I think, Ken, you, I know things you picked up this morning, really, really important and, and similar to, to my group. So mm -hmm. how does it work for you, Ken? Well, I think what I was going to say is drawing on my own experience. So when I, I went to university at 18, and if I'm honest, I struggled and I dropped out after a year. And part of the, the problem was that I didn't know who to ask for help. Okay. Um, I, I, I think the important thing is that in, in the university, we've got a whole te different teams of people that want to help. The IT team want to help you with your IT issues. The library want to help you find the right book. Student services want to help you get the best experience. The students union wants to help you get the whole student experience. Your academic staff want to help you to learn. And particularly if you're at level four, but at various points in people's student lives, you can think, I, I don't know who to ask. Um, and I think one of the things that has been really beneficial this year is the hub mm -hmm. is there. If you're not sure who to ask, ask the hub and they will help you find the right person. Um, there are people whose jobs who desperately want to help you. If they don't know you're there, they can't. So reach out, ask the hub, let the hub put you in touch with the right person, and hopefully you won't end up having the experience that I had. Well, actually, actually, that's fabulous, Ken. Um, and the other thing is the guys in the hub have got a sense of humour. In fact, yeah. I think most of the departments have a sense of humour. Um, and the trouble is perhaps you, you sometimes catch us on the rye, but actually, you know, let's put it bluntly, guys. If we don't support you, you don't come to uni. If you don't come to uni, we haven't got a job. Yeah. Now, I do it because I actually happen to like doing what I do. As I say, it's an honour. But without you guys, you actually are the ones who have the rights in law. I mean, we touch about the legal side and you are entitled to so much. And many of you never, never access them. Do you realise there's bursaries available for most of you? Have you gone to student services? Which bursaries could I apply for? Because we'll sign them off as lecturers. Um, there's bursaries because of COVID in regards to IT. Do you know that? Go and get them. 
you know, the student services will do assessments for learning differences. I've got loads of them. Go and get it sorted because money and, and kit and one to one might follow. In law, you're entitled. Make sure you stand up and get your rights because you won't be able to help others get their rights unless you do it for yourselves. And we will sign the forms. That's basically it. Absolutely. Well said, both. Well said. And I've I've just realised this is this is for the editing because I was doing that unscripted. I forgot to mention registry. Whoops. Oh. But anyway, there's loads of teams, loads of teams that are there to support you. <laughs> I think you'll have to edit it. Just, just put registry out the, port again. the porters are actually really amazing. And the, and the staff who do the cleaning and the staff who do the catering. Because they are the guys that have a chat with you and say, oh, this thing's going then. Oh, I've had a really bad day. I tell you who you need to talk to. It's amazing. Without them, we wouldn't get money of the signposts. Someone will come up to me. Look, someone said I had a little war with me. Oh, do you know, I didn't know that. Thanks. Are they are they happy for me to know? Yes, they have. I've asked them because they also do the GDPR and the data protection. But they are signposters because they are the people on the front line. And I tell you what, I don't care whether you're the cleaner or the vice chancellor. We are a team that does it together. You know, you know we're all trying to land a man on the moon in that sense. And That's just the person on the moon. Well, it was said a man on, of its time, so I'm quoting of the time. <laughs> now, it's a human being of its time now. So, but the point being is, is who, when you go and visit Disney, who do you ask for directions? And this was one of the questions that have come up before. And you ask the guy or the girl or the woman or the man or the person who's sweeping up the rubbish on the floor. And the truth is, they're not sweeping up the rubbish on the floor. They're actually there to help, but in, they're in disguise. And this is the clever thing about Disney is that these people who, oh, I'll ask the cleaner now, or oh, I'll ask the porter, these guys are a mine of information and they're approachable. So when I arrived at uh, university, I had the feeling, which created by Caroline, I've got to say, uh, to start with, and then by the whole team behind was, well, where have you been? We've been waiting for you. Come on, grab a chair. Let's get going. You know, there's your place in the classroom. Guys, we are so pleased that you're here. We are privileged to be part of your learning journey. And I'm saying we, not just the three of us in, in the, the recording today, but look at your lecturers. They're human beings with uh, with all the faults and, and uh, failings as the rest of us. But guess what? Maybe not perfect human beings, but perfect intentions. So we are intent on getting you across that finishing line with the best possible degree that you can achieve. And, and guys, Wish you all the best then in your careers from there. So that's a genuine desire on, on everybody's part. So Caroline hit the nail on the head there. What is this place without you? We need to look after each other and be kind to each other. And then we'll all make it over the finishing line at, at some point in time. So guys, enjoy your learning journey. That's awesome. That's a really nice way to end the support one. So the kind of last question that I've got for you really is if a student would like to continue past postgraduate study and eventually lecture, do you have any advice? Well, funny enough, <laughs> <laughs> I made the tactical error of looking at this person called Philip Morgan in this video and going, hmm, he's going to give me, actually, the, the, the thought that came through my mind when I first interviewed Phil, um, as I say, I'm, Phil was a student originally, okay? I met Phil and I thought, he's got an opinion. He cares, he's passionate, he's hungry for learning. He's going to give the class a run for the money. Actually, I hope he comes on the course. He came on the course. He give, did give me a run for the money, I have to say. But why did he move on? Well, straight away, um, when he was at university, I had some research projects. And, and I had to have a, a researcher. So it's only paid job, it's not expensive, not, not a lot of money. But he got involved with some of the research. So straight away, he'd upped his credentials because now his portfolio was he was doing his degree and he was actually a research active. A job came up and I suggested he go for it. And I said, what you need to do is A, B and C. And so Phil eventually became a lecturer here. This has happened time and time again with students I've had. I mean, there's a lot of I was about 15 members of staff I've lectured over the years um, that were students and they are homegrown. Mm -hmm. One of the things that is there is you need to demonstrate that you're um, professional, that you have sustainability, that you have a respect for being there if you've got to be in the lecture or being online if you've got to be online, to submit your work in time. Have an inquiring mind. I always say that one of the things which is really important for a lecturer or a researcher is to be systematically nosy. 
Mm -hmm. I'm teaching my level sevens, my masters this weekend on research methods, and I have it one of my slides. Systematically lousy, or is it a research academic? They're the same thing. It's the same thing. So, <laughs> so one of the things I would suggest is take every opportunity, be a student ambassador, get involved with any research projects are there, even if you are volunteering to do. Get involved with going out um, and working with the lecturers on projects, whether it's archaeological digs, whether it's taking a trip abroad with humanities, whether it's coming to do some research work, whatever it is, get involved. The extra mile matters. Um, so with that many students that have now become lecturers, I find it very humorous. I look at them now and some of them got a really senior position. I'm going, hey, I was part of that journey. Isn't that fab? But consistently it was they were when i say a good student it doesn't mean to be the best student guys a good student and the best student is a different thing a good student is a reliable student as i say i have very you know over the years some very intelligent students that are absolutely gifted on ability to write but they're what i call dissolute they don't commit so when they do it they get a 90. But when they don't they don't submit Give me a student who is a solid 60 to 70, who is consistent and reliable, who, when given a responsibility, takes that on, who demonstrates in lecture they can actually hold an academic argument. I want, and I know the three of us do, I want someone to come into a lecture and, cha and challenge me. Oh, I don't know if you're right, Caroline. Great. Why don't you think I'm right? Well, I look this up and that. Let's look at the argument. Now, do you know what? You might have a point. I'm going to go away and research you. Let's come back next week. And the class benefits. That's the mind that we know that when they come and be a lecturer, they'll do their homework. They will continue to research. They will continue to keep up with their subject area. Um, and the biggest thing is have a passion. Does everybody who do that get to be a lecturer? No. But there are other jobs also that are there. It might be working in an international office. It might be working in registry. It might be working you will be surprised and to just say the last thing is that um i was a student at university too in the university of Austria in st david 22 years ago so there you go um yeah isn't that interesting um and i got in because i was doing a master's i got a call back caroline i okay i did several other things as well and again i was one of those students who did things and i was inquiring got a call back you'll want to do a master's you're really determined i've you know heard a lot of people say that you are determined and you really want to, you know, you you will you will do it even if it costs you, mm -hmm. and you're reliable. Would you like a job as a research assistant? So I came in as a research assistant, exactly the same as Phil, and then within two weeks, uh, would you mind lecturing? And I had to. Then we had to type out research papers every week, guys. No PowerPoint, no internet. We every week we had to do a fully referenced research paper, right? Uh, and you got three lectures on things like sociolinguistics. I'd done a bit. Hadn't done a lot. I had to work my butt off to do it, but they knew I would do it because I'm systematically nosy. And I, I think there's there's one, one thing I'd, I'd like to add. And interestingly, this is pertinent because this morning in the post, I got my level two uh, certificate from City and Guilds in independent advocacy. Yeah, we've was, all taken that, haven't we? Which yeah. was, of course, the three of us sat together as a small module but at level two in advocacy skills. And it reminds me of something I was told when I trained to do my PGCE up in Bolton. And the, the most inspirational lecture, lecturer was the person who modelled what he was telling us to do. And he basically said one of the most important things if you're going to teach is to remember what it's like to be a student. Oh. Never move away from the point of remembering what it was like to sit that first time online or in a lecture theatre yeah. and every year he went to learn something new he learned to juggle one year he learned to fly fish the next and he always said i want to remember what it's like to be a student the three of us have had that experience this year at, together independently we do it as well i think that's a key if you're going to teach remember what it was like to be a student and for every hour you teach there's about 50 15 to 25 behind the scenes of paperwork if you don't <laughs> like paperwork and you don't like admin, and you don't like keeping your files and organisations straight, don't be a lecturer. And that reality Serious. check came. <laughs> there is an awful lot of that. And the last thing I would say about being a lecturer is every time I start a lecture for the first time after the summer, before oh. I walk through that door, my, my stomach has butterflies. I've been yep. doing it for over 20 years. And you know what? I'm glad it does because it keeps uh -huh. me on my toes. If I become complacent and walk in and think, whatever, I've stopped being a good lecturer. I need to get my coat and walk.
So can I just like add a little uh, tip? Of to course, this? Bill, you always this are. Yeah. So I, I, I've been holding my tongue here for a long time because I, I, I love, I, I, like I said, we're all passionate. We all want to speak yeah, and, and share. Yeah, but it, my learning journey, particularly, and then, yeah, researcher, yeah, came on board. Uh, but I, I've been a, a heating engineer and, and an engineer in, in the oil industry for many years, okay? And then I suddenly arrive in this thing called social inclusion, but a couple of things had happened before then. So I have my NVQ level three, which I value to this day. One of the things that's really important is as you arrive in academia and then you think, well, I want to be a lecturer, I wouldn't mind. You need experience. You need a knowledge base from having um, experienced life and work and, and employment. For me, I knew when I arrived at 50, I couldn't generate 20 years of experience in social care and life. So you've got to draw upon your experiences. The other thing you can do is to register with an employment agency. So what I found was for me, I was interested in social justice and social inclusion and things like that. So I registered with a, um, a recruitment agency based in, in Cardiff, which I'm happy to share on a different uh, time who they were. But they were brilliant. They said they'd give me opportunity, they'd train me and they'd give me loads and loads of work. So my text was arrived. Would I want to work in a, a care home for working with looked after children? Did I want to work in the bail hostel? Did I work, want to work in a wet house, a dry house? Could I go and teach in a school for a day? So all of a sudden I had all of this breadth of experience in a very short period of time. Because at 50, I can't look back at 20 years of you know life uh, in the community, as it were. But then I'd been a heating engineer for a while. Every day I knocked on 10 doors. Every day I got to see an insight into the real world. So when we have applicants arrive and they say, oh, I've only ever been a hairdresser. I went, Woof, I'm OK with a hairdresser, but don't use the only word because their communication skills will be off the chart. So this is where we recognise common skills and things that allow students from a widening access to get a degree, which um, has been said uh, on many occasions that they couldn't go to any other university to achieve a degree because of the pastoral and the way we teach, all the support that's around. So in terms of how you get there, it is a mix of experience, it's a mix of academic, the willingness to participate in activities, having the opportunity to, to do research with an experienced researcher as I had with Caroline and, and uh, the team. So beyond that then, what about your own research? So one of the things I was encouraged to do was to write something for the um, the student researcher publication. So before so I graduated- Published by the university. Yeah, this, this is, and, and Caroline uh, encouraged and pushed, not just me, but a range of us to, to work towards this. But I was blooming well determined to get this on my on my CV that I was published. My children had been off to university and when I published, they were, wow, this is amazing. So the university offers students this opportunity to showcase their work. Guys, jump in there if you're passionate about it. Yeah, the other thing that goes with that, Phil, I mean, there's so many things you can do if you want to be a lecturer. If you've got a specific knowledge base or had a particular experience or gone abroad or worked with an organisation that relates to your course, say, can I just have 10 minutes to talk to the, st oh. the other students? Because yeah. actually nothing like getting up and having a go. Other things to do is PSET courses, which is the Postgraduate Certificate in Education. We actually deliver them in the university and you can link up with your subject area. So we've had a number of PSET students, one of them who's become an hourly paid lecturer, who actually was you working at a bar for years? She was barmaid. She's mar marvelous. She can hack anything that comes at her in a class. Absolutely. She's fabulous, absolutely fabulous. But the experience that she's got is amazing. So, guys, there are so many different ways of coming into academia. What I would say is you've got to put yourself out of it. You can't just, it will not come on the plate. No. Well, will it come on the plate? We will offer to many students, but very few will take it up. We often say to our students, you know, if you've done that, do you want to come and talk? Well, I'm not sure if I'll do that. And do you remember that we were talking about seminar presentations? Well, that is a really good thing to practice doing your lecture because a seminar presentation, you are speaking in front of an audience. So if that's what you want to do, make sure you do your best and practice on your seminars. There's so much you can do. And also the other thing, which is what Ken would probably tell, if because if we gave him a chance, 
is Mark in Student Services, who does careers, mm. have a chat with Mark. There are also research projects out there that if you talk to a lecturer and say, look, I've searched some research that's got research project funding. Go and look for something that you're interested in. Have a chat to a lecturer and say, look, do you think I'm, I'd, I'd be interested in if you would let me to could you consider this research funding opportunity because the university has to run these things. But could we do it that perhaps you write me in as a research assistant? A bit naughty, but to tell you what, if a student come to me, I go, OK, it's a sassy one. I'll tell you what, I'll have a look. Yeah, because <laughs> I'm a sassy one myself. <laughs> OK. Yeah. But anyway, so there's got so many ways. Basically, just think about it. What is it a lecturer does? They have knowledge which come out through here and they've got to be organised to do it and care. If you don't care about your subject, for goodness sake, there's yeah. nothing worse than a really boring lecturer. Passion and lived experience and qualification. This and um, Caroline's point, uh, this nosiness, this are you Systematic is my yeah. friend. Well put. And I think this is what we all have um, and, and that passion. So Tommy, does that help sort of give you a flavour for what we feel works to support students and support them? Oh, hi, absolutely. That was honestly brilliant. I didn't realise there was so many ways into um, like lecturing and stuff. So I thought it was kind of a PGC boom, 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 carry on that way. So that's yeah. really interesting. So it is an option once you finish your undergrad studies to go to MA. That's natural. Some people go to PGCE and then the MA later. So, you know, some way, different ways suit, suit different people, their needs. And, um, you know, we're just happy to support and be there. And it's fun. We cry oh. sometimes, but we laugh often as lecturers. Yeah. And that's about sums it up. There are some, moments when we go, no, Tesco. Sometimes, sometimes the laughter is hysterical, but we do oh, laugh as lecturers. It's mental health week, guys. Come on. <laughs> but we're still here after so many years, you know. So why do we do it? Because we actually enjoy it. And we think yep. it matters. It Absolutely. Matters. And we all love technology, and my technology is now telling me that my computer is about to restart. It's so, had enough of you, Phil. It's, it's saying, quite, shut it's up, quite. Phil. <laughs> Someone make him stop, is it? <laughs> like, Caroline programmed it earlier. <laughs> uh, are we well, done, that's Tommy? actually all the questions um, I had. We've covered like most of the right. topics and everything. That was awesome. Thank you so, so much.